Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Davis Parent University Lecture Series. We'd like to welcome to the stage tonight our moderator, a former news anchor for KCRA TV, currently the communications director at UC Davis School of Law, and a contributing host for the Capital Public Radio, our dear friend, the one and only Miss Pamela Wu. Welcome to the spring lecture of the Davis Parent University, which is now incredibly in its seventh year. I'm always thrilled and honored to be here. These presentations always deliver information that is cutting edge, useful, and this time could save lives. A Deadly Wandering is the best-selling book by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author Matt Rickdahl. It weaves the science of attention with the wrenching story of a car accident that killed two rocket scientists, an accident caused by distracted driving. Reggie Shaw, the young man behind the wheel, later said, I used my phone when I drove all the time. To me, that was just driving. So many adults and teens behave the same way. In recent days, knowing that I would be addressing you here tonight, I've been counting how many people I see texting or looking at their phones in the car. I look around when I'm stopped at the stoplight and observe. And on one day when I had done a pretty fair amount of driving, I stopped counting when I got to 30. We usually don't have many kids in the audience at our events, only parents, but I'm happy to see that there are some teenagers here with us tonight. If we can keep even one person, a teen or an adult, from engaging with their phone while driving, it will have been worth it. Now, the reviews for this book, A Deadly Wandering, have been nothing short of spectacular. The New York Times book review praised it, saying, it deserves a spot next to Fast Food Nation and to kill a mockingbird in American high school curriculums. To say that it may save lives is self-evident. The Christian Science Monitor called it keen and elegantly raw, not just a morality tale about texting and driving, but also a probe sent into the world of technology, examining the way that it's outstripping our capability to keep up with it, and how we as a culture are feeding bullets into the techno gun and playing with it. The book asks difficult questions that force us to ask why we can't resist the pull of the phone even when we know better. Rickdahl writes, I'm trying to better understand why two rocket scientists are dead. Was it because Reggie, for some reason, lost his focus? Was he distracted? What was happening inside his brain? Can the research being done by a new generation of neuroscientists prevent similar tragedy? More basically, what is attention? Now that I have your attention, I would like to first thank DPU's business and community sponsors before we bring our <laughs> keynote to the stage. Let's start with Davis Media Access, which records all the DPU lectures and uploads them to the DNA website for the many who cannot attend. Let's have a round of applause. <laughs> also the Avid Reader, which donates 10% of the author's book sales to DPU. Suzanne Kimmel of First Real Estate, Rose Cholowinski of Swim America, Golden One Credit Union, John Newman of Hallmark in UC Davis, and Ashley and Nancy Hughes. And now for the main program. We're going to begin with a 45 to 50 minute talk by Matt Rickdahl, a 20 minute Q&A, followed by a book signing in the front foyer, and then a nine o'clock house close. If you have a burning question during or after keynote, just jot down the question on the index card that you should have received when you first entered the theater. The cards are going to be collected immediately following the talk. Also, thank you as well to the many of you who emailed questions ahead of the lecture. We're going to try to get in as many of your questions as possible. Now it is my honor to introduce tonight's keynote speaker, Matt Rickson. <coughs> this best-selling author and New York Times reporter has covered a range of issues, including the impact of, impact of technology in our lives. In 2010, he won the Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting for a series of articles that exposed the pervasive risks of distracted driving and its root causes. Importantly, that work led to widespread reform. 
The nonfiction thriller, A Deadly Wandering, explored these issues. It was a New York Times bestseller and was named the best book of 2014 by various publications. It is the true story of a deadly, mysterious car crash that leads to a landmark investigation into what technology is doing to our brains. Richter is also the author of acclaimed thrillers, most recently The Doomsday Equation. He is a graduate of Columbia Journalism School and UC Berkeley, although we won't hold that against him. <laughs> he lives in San Francisco with his wife and their two children, and we are so glad that he braved the traffic on Interstate 80 to appear at Davis Perry University tonight. Please join me in welcoming to the stage author Matt Rizzo. Thank you, Pam. Uh, by, way, by way of saying thank you, I'd like to tell you a quick story uh, about a different book, Not Deadly Wandering, although I will get to that shortly. It's a story about, <clears throat> it's a story about, I'm just going to move over here. Can you guys hear me okay with the, yeah. My, my first book was called Hooked, and it came out in 2007. It was, uh, it was a thriller. And a friend of mine went to Barnes & Noble, and he saw the book uh, on a front table. You know those front tables at the bookstore? It was there sandwiched between a Superman anthology and a book by Martha Stewart. So this friend of mine, is, he's excited. It's, yeah, it's my first book, his friend's first book. He takes out his camera phone to take a picture of it, and from behind the counter, the clerk walks out. He says, uh, excuse me, sir, I was wondering what you were doing. <clears throat> and my, my friend said, oh, I'm, uh, I'm taking a picture of my friend's book. And the guy from behind the counter says, you've got to be kidding me. You're friends with Martha Stewart? <laughs> First of all, I, I am merely a journalist, a scribe with a pen and a notebook. I, I am not a celebrity like Martha Stewart, and yet you have had me here tonight. If you came looking for a souffle recipe, I apologize. Um, I also, in particular, want to thank Christy Fries and, and Jody Lederman and the DPU committee for having me here. And actually, could all of you stand, because I, I want to mention something about this group. Could all of the members... that at this moment, 
At this moment, I think of, I think that you think is one thing. It is a relationship that's pretty even-handed. It's a relationship where you are getting a lot of things that you might define as productivity, communication, entertainment. I am hopeful and I expect that after the next 45 minutes or so of neuroscience and some Q&A, you are going to realize that it's a much worse relationship than you think, than you think right now. It's not going to take you a few years like your high school relationship to look back and say that wasn't so great. An hour from now, you're going to say, this relationship is based on things other than what I thought. My phone is something other than what I thought. But in order to get us there, I want to start, I want to start by going back into the car. The relationship I'm talking about goes far beyond it. It goes into your, into your, into your living room and into your relationship, into your workroom, your boardroom. But I want to start the car, and I want to do it for a reason that will become clear. And I want to do it by virtue of telling you just briefly and showing you about the young man and his tragedy that Pam alluded to earlier. This is Reggie Shaw. There's something I want you to notice about Reggie that you've probably already inferred. Reggie has terrifically kind eyes. Reggie is a very, very nice young man. As I got to know Reggie, I thought, that's the kind of guy I wanted to be friends with in high school. He's the kind of guy that moms wanted their daughters to date and that teachers really appreciated. He was 19 years old on September 22, 2006. And he was driving to work that morning in a Chevy Tahoe at 6.30 in the morning across this Verdant Valley in northern Utah. Picture a winding road going through hills, 55 miles an hour, despite the fact that it's the last day of summer. It's already starting to rain, it's freezing rain, it's dark out. Behind Reggie is a guy named John Kaiser. John Kaiser is a certified farrier. Actually, in Davis, you may, you may well know the term. I didn't know it until I started working on the story. He's a certified horseshoe maker. So it explains why he is carrying it with his truck a trailer with two tons of horseshoes and horseshoe making equipment. This is a missile at highway speeds. And John Kaiserman is noticing that Reggie is occasionally going across the yellow divider. I asked John what he thought later on. He's kind of a soft spoken, little stoic guy, a handlebar mustache works on his farm, he said, he said to me, and I quote, I thought to myself, this guy's going to cause us all some trouble. Coming the other direction of our, coming the other direction that morning are Jim Fafaro and Keith O'Dell. They're in a Saturn. Pam mentioned that they're rocket scientists. Not a cliche in this case. Genuine, bona fide rocket scientists. They are building the booster for the next space shuttle. They're commuting to work. One of them's eating a Fuji apple his wife gave him, gave him. The other one munching on some Cheerios from a Ziploc bag. The last time that Reggie crosses the yellow divider, he clips the Saturn coming the other direction. They spin out of control. This is what it looked like when John Kaiser did it. This is what it looked like when John Kaiser hit him. This is their Saturn. You'll forgive me for being a little bit grotesque, but I think it, it bears mention. Not only are the men dead on arrival, but the, sorry, dead in the moment, dead on impact, but the collision is so violent they have to search for their idols. 100 down, yards down the road, Reggie stops in his Chevy Tahoe, which is virtually unscathed. He is unhurt. He says, I have no idea what happened. Maybe I. Maybe a hydro point. Maybe they came into my land. Bart Rindelsbacher is one of the first officers to show up at the scene. He's one tough guy. Just back from my rap where he sniffed up, sniffed out the roadside bombs. He takes Reggie to the hospital and he notices that as he's driving Reggie to the hospital to get a drug and alcohol test, mandatory and a fatality, that Reggie starts to text with one hand and Bart says to me, I realized at that moment, this guy was a one-hander. 
I'll cut to the chase. Months long investigation follows that becomes an extraordinary whodunit. A veritable law and order meets a digital crime, discovers that Reggie had been texting 11 times in the minutes and seconds around the record. Some innocuous stuff he couldn't even remember to a young woman that he'd sort of started dating. Put a fine point on it. This is Keith's widow. Why am I mentioning this? Well, let's just get to the facts really quick about texting and driving before we move beyond it. Before I take you inside Reggie's brain, and inside your own brain, when you're interacting with the device, in the car, and outside of the car. We're going to laser inside his brain. We're going we're to move inside of it. Let's just talk for a second. 23 times, I'm sure you've heard these stats. Greater risk of crash or near crash when you're texting. Four times greater risk of crash when you're talking on the phone, whether or not that's hands-free. We'll talk about why that is later. Look, since 2006, when this accident happened, we have all come to agree, when I say all, 84.4% say texting and driving is completely unacceptable. Just give me a show of hands. Would you tend to agree with that statement? Okay. Forgive this turn of phrase. I, don't, I mean it is no insult. That's what monkeys say. Here's what monkey do. 36% have read a text or email in the last 30 days while driving. 27% have sent one. I want you to look at those numbers. 36%, let's just seize on that. The year's night is 2004. So, since 2006, all these laws have been passed, all this public awareness. Here's the punchline. 36% in 2004, that is up from 2012. All the laws, 46 states, public awareness campaigns all the time. The number has gone up. I want you to sneeze on this word. Disconnect. This is a massive, profound disconnect between professed attitudes and actual behaviors. As I thought about this disconnect, getting up, getting bigger, not smaller, I can only think of one parallel in public health that is so profound as this disconnect between professed attitudes and behaviors. I know it's a big crowd. Anybody want to take a shot at shouting out what that might be? Probably. Booyah. Who said that? Smoking. Almost everyone you talk to, I've done stories, I, did a, I spent a year doing stories on electronic cigarettes, talked to a lot of smokers. To a person, they will tell you, this will kill me. This is a very bad idea. Why do they do it? Addiction. I'm going to stop short tonight of making the case, while we talk about your relationship with your phone, that you are addicted. It's a very big clinical word, but I'm going to move you toward the notion that in your relationship with your device, you are experiencing compul compulsion and habituation that borders on addiction. It is not a addiction in the clinical sense, but it is nearing that place. So, I just want to add that those are the, those are the, the tweeting numbers. These are the other things people are doing on behind the wheel now. 27% of drivers age 16 to 65 report using Facebook. 14% report using Twitter. 10% take and send uh, videos. This is the uh, this is the one that most strikes me. 17% take selfies. Nothing could be a more salient metaphor for what we're talking about right now. Thinking of yourself at the expense of all others. Okay, so now, let's take a travel inside Reggie's brain, inside your brain, so that we can try to determine, we can try to figure out, how is it that in spite of all this awareness and these laws, the disconnect continues to grow? To do this, I would like to ask you to go on a journey with me. It's a journey back in time, I want everyone to channel their inner cave person. I want you to picture that you are a cave person sitting in front of a fire. 
Now, I have a suggestion for those of you who are feeling like you may have trouble doing this. You ready? Picture yourself just a lot hairier. <laughs> All right, you got it? You're tending to a fire. We're going to travel inside Reggie's brain and inside your brain. You're tending to the fire. This is my fire. You get a tap on the shoulder from behind. Can you ignore the tap on the shoulder from behind? No way. Why not? You don't know if it's opportunity or threat. Is it someone with a spear? Is it a potential mate? Is it someone with food? Is it someone saying lava? Is it the roar of a lion rather than a tap on the shoulder? Of course you can't ignore that tap on the shoulder. Now, shed your fur, your cave person fur. Picture yourself again behind, now behind the, a wheel. You're tending to drive it. Your phone rings. This is a proverbial tap on the shoulder from anyone, anywhere in the world. Is it opportunity? Is it threat? Is it someone telling you to, asking you to pick up some milk on the way home? Is it your boss? Is it your spouse? Is it your child? Is it a friend? All of these things act like a proverbial tap on the shoulder. They are very, very alluring, and I'm going to show you why by taking you inside your brain. Look, when you're tending to the fire, when you're focused on something that requires attention, it takes up this part of your brain. Broadly speaking, it's the prefrontal cortex, the frontal, the frontal lobe of your brain. It is the most evolved part of the human species. It is responsible for art, architecture, civilization, literature. I was going to add politics, but these days that might be <laughs> something about the brain stem. <laughs> this is responsible for attention and focus, executive control. But, but, when you get a tap on the shoulder from behind, the signal comes from here. These are parts of the brain that we share with much less evolved animals. The brain stem, survival areas of the brain. It sends a signal that says, roar of a lion, run or die. It sends a signal that says, Someone with a jab, with a spear, turn or perish. It sends a signal that says, potential mate, turn or lose opportunity. It is a very powerful signal that for very good reason, not always, not always as you'll see tonight, but for very good reason begins to hijack this. There are times we want to hijack this. There are times we do not want to hijack this. The first thing I want you to internalize tonight I'm going to make a kind of legalistic argument about your relationship with your phone, and point one of it is to remember and think about the mechanical signal that's being sent from here to here. It's a very basic, neuro neurological, primitive signal, hijacking this by this. Now, I always hesitate to send it to, to show this slide for reasons that I'll explain in a minute. But before I do, I want to explain why this, this effect, this mechanism, can be even more pronounced in young people. It's because this, the prefrontal cortex here, exemplified by the more maturing brain in the purple, doesn't develop until you get older. So you're even more susceptible to that pain when you're younger. The reason I hesitate to mention it is that while it is worth bearing that in mind, this is not a problem, an issue, a mechanism that attends solely to young people. In fact, for the most part, this is something that affects all of us. It's worth knowing, it's worth knowing that your teens, or if you are teens, that your kids, your grandkids, may feel this to a greater extent, but we all feel it to a large extent. It's more so around the margins than it affects young people. Well, this this is just this is this is just really the slide should be titled uh, "Presenter has too much time to create PowerPoint." <laughs> uh, but this is this goes back to why we adhere to this. 
to the survival instinct under certain circumstances. Because if you were a gay person and you did look, you might have your face eaten. So, okay, before I go on with the, I think that's the last of the slides that, where I had too much time, but you really wouldn't want it to happen. Um, look, um, I want to pause before I get to the next three items, reasons why your phone is not what you think, why it's so seductive. But before I do that, I'm wondering if Pam could come up and be humiliated for a second. <laughs> Is that all right? All right, come on up, man. All right, Pam, I'm going to ask you to uh, face our, our phenomenal audience and, as quickly as you might, recite the letters A to I. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Big hand, big round of applause. She's invited every year. <laughs> now, how about the numbers one to nine as fast as you can? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. A trick. A trick. A trick. And now, the tricky part. You have to alternate as fast as you might A1, B2, C3, and so forth. Okay. A1, B2, C3, D4, E5, F6. Alright, a big hand. <laughs> So important, so crucial 
to our survival, that if you talk to evolutionary biologists, they will tell you that they're not sure if it's a learned behavior or actually encoded on our DNA. And to show you this, I'll go back to our cave person. Let's say there's a, I'm friend, I've got a fellow cave person, he's sitting in front of the fire, he puts his hand in the fire and he burns it. And he gets an infection, this is long ago before antibiotics. If he can't tell me that burning the fire caused him to have an infection and made him sick enough, then I have to do the same thing. I have to learn it myself. There is no human species. We never propagate absent social information. It is so deeply in us that evolutionary biologists don't know whether it is learned at the most primitive level or it's actually encoded on our double helix. So now you've got a mechanical impulse and you, you've got a device that's sending you information that by its nature is among the most alluring that you could possibly get. There's something else about that information. All right, trick question. If your phone gives you a lot of irrelevant information, i.e. spam, does it make it more or less alluring? Show of hands for people who think, if you think your phone is less seductive or your computer, I use phone as a proxy, as a standard, is your phone or computer more seduct less seductive if you get a bunch of crud? Show of hands. Less seductive. This is one of the pieces of trivia I found most uh, extraordinary as I was researching the book. It makes your phone more seductive. Here's why. Let's go back, not as far as the cave person, the B.F. Skinner. Skinnerian psychology, I'm sure in this crowd many know of it. He did a, he did a, a, a basic bit of uh, research that involved putting a rat in a cage. There's a lever in the cage. The rat doesn't know which press of the lever is going to bring food. It's random. So what is the rat, rat incentivized to do? The rat is incentivized to press the lever all the time. Never knows when the good stuff's going to come. It's one of the most powerful lures in all of psychology. It's called intermittent reinforcement. If you'll forgive the comparison of us to, it's not really a comparison of us to rodents because the iPhones haven't gotten that small where the phones can the rats can use them. But you take the point. Here's what the psychologists will call it. They'll call it a slot machine in your car. That's what the scientists say to me. You've seen driving through Reno with the one-armed bandit and the cup of coins. Think about that image occasionally when you see someone lost in their phone. Part of what they may be doing, part of what you may be doing, part of what I know I do sometimes, is just wait for the good one. I don't really need to be looking at the phone at that moment. We'll talk more about this in a second. Let me build up where we are. Mechanical, the hijack, social information, the fact that you get a lot of crud and it actually makes your device more seductive. Okay, there's one more that I want to mention right now. You guys have heard of dopamine, the neurochemical. It's a pleasure, it's a, it's a reward chemical. It's associated with all kinds of wonderful things and some not so wonderful things. Food, achievement, it's a very powerful, very necessary, very val valuable neurochemical. It can be not so valuable at times, like with cocaine or other drugs. The research I'm about to mention is a little more embryonic than what I've told you so far. I always want to make that caveat. I've sort of internalized the New York Times ethics and ethos of not going beyond what the facts will show. But what the facts will show is that there is early evidence, fledgling evidence, nascent evidence, that suggests when you're interacting with your device, you're getting bursts of dopamine. You're getting bursts of reward. Here's the, here's the theory that the scientists have begun to develop around this. Have you ever had the feeling that you're sort of just sitting there, you got your phone, maybe you're in the stoplight, maybe you're in the checkout aisle, maybe you're in the movie line, maybe you're sitting at dinner, and you start getting kind of a Jones to check your phone? Does that resonate with anybody? Just a random Jones hit. But here's what some of the scientists think about when they, when they discuss this. They say, you interact with your phone and you get a little burst of dopamine. You interact with your phone and you get a burst of dopamine. You interact with your phone again and you get a little burst of dopamine. 
you don't interact with your phone, and you get a little bit bored. So what do you do? You go hunt out that feeling, that pleasure chemical. It's the kind of cycle that is associated very much with habituation, compulsion, and it can be associated with addiction. I want to read to you a quote from a guy who teaches internet addiction at a major medical school, graduate medical school. David Greenfield, University of Connecticut, he says, you see the computer, it's one trigger. Then you sit at the keyboard, it's another. You push the key, you get a result. There's a cascade of dopamine. It's the big kahuna. It's, in a sense, an narcotic. The reason that I stop short, incidentally, of using the term addictive is that, because this may well sound like addiction, and you may well feel in your relationship with your phone that you've got some of those feelings that you would associate with addiction. I stop short personally. I, David Greenfield will go further, but I stop short because it presently, the way scientists clinically de define the, the addic the, an addictive substance is when you can start to see changes in the brain, like heroin. In fact, so controversial, for want of a better word, is this issue that there's some debate about whether even gambling is addictive because it's a behavior and not a substance. That's why I stopped short on that issue. Um, one last thing I want to add to this. You may, you may think, and I, I can imagine you would perceive from the way I've been describing this, that I'm talking about responding to your phone. That that's the nature of the relationship I'm describing. You in response to your phone. But, but I'm really not, given this additional piece of information. What Harvard researchers realize is we get the same kind of dopamine release when we share personal information. The very kind of information we often share on our phones. Humans so willingly self-disclose because doing so represents an event with intrinsic value in the same way as with other primary awards. So when you pick up your phone, you may be starting off a chain of dopamine. You may be sharing information that gives you a burst, and maybe if you're like me, I've noticed this in myself, sometimes when I'm bored, I'll start a cascade of interactions because I know that each receipt once I start something, I am due for a receipt. Okay, I want to add it up for you. I want to add up what we've described here. Tap on the shoulder, intermittent reinforcement, the social value, the dopamine squirt. What's it equal? Okay. Um, by California <laughs> law, you cannot do a PowerPoint without a Simpson slide. I don't understand this. <laughs> and oddly, the royalties go to George Lucas. I can't figure it out. Gratuitous Star Wars. Uh. Look, let me tell you why I'm, I'm showing this slide, and I'll do it in a bit of a long-winded fashion. I want to take you back. I want you to set everything aside, and I want to take you back in time to a different time. Industrialization of food. This is a parallel that I want to draw for you tonight when we talk about what's happening with our brains. When we industrialized food, it was, by almost every measure, a wonderful thing. More food to more people, more calories, on trucks, automated in farms, into central locations and markets where people could eat. More people survive. More industry. On the whole, terrific. There are some downsides that it has taken us almost this long to realize that are nearly as powerful or have the potential to be on the negative side as all the positives is the industrial, on the, of the industrialization of food. And I'm speaking here of junk food, of crud, of sugar, of fat that gets manufactured for us. Let me give you an example by way of the Dorito. I'm not thinking on you, Dorito. It could be anything that Homer Simpson reaches for in there. But look, here's, here's what's going on with the Dorito, the way scientists have described it for me. It has a wonderful, it mimics a wonderful amount of sugar and fat. A wonderful amount, that is, if you have hiked through the jungle, gone into a cave, fought and killed a woolly mammoth, and satisfied the amount of fat and sugar that is contained in that thing. It calls to a very primitive part of, our, part of our brain, and we've synthesized it. Now, you don't have to go kill a woolly mammoth. You need some quarters and a vending machine. This is 
what I think is going on today. What I think by virtue not of my own, you know, synthesis, but my own synthesis talking to many scientists about this subject. We are with technology today as we were once with the industrialization of food. There is so much extraordinary about technology. Make no mistake, this is not a screen against technology by any stretch. All those things, all those attributes I mentioned earlier, they are all true. But we are beginning to realize that there are downsides, much in the same way that there are downsides to the industrialization of food. And I want to put it, I want to read you from an MD Yale professor who says the cell phone meets a deep need for social connection with a greater ease and greater potential detriment to do it in the same way that a vending machine that is right down the hall plays to our need for calories. What does this mean? It means that some of the mechanisms, some of the primitive mechanisms that have evolved over many, many years to serve us in the most extraordinary and beneficial ways that enable our survival, like social communication, and like this taking over this, are being tapped into by this device. It has the capacity to hijack our brains the way junk food can hijack our taste buds even when it has ceased to serve us. There can be no greater example than behind the wheel. It defies all common sense. You are piloting a missile. But the reason why it's valuable to ground this conversation in the phone, in the, in the car, is not just to make that point. It's because if we're doing it there, where else are we doing it? Where else are we being hijacked in ways where it has ceased to serve our stated purpose or the purpose that might best serve us, however we define it? I can't, I can't answer that for each and every one of you, but what I can begin to do is to talk to you about ways that you can understand the balance, that you can begin to define what for you, for you is junk food, and even begin to immediately identify spots where you're being hijacked and you don't realize it. Or being hijacked in ways that are taking a toll that is the neurological equivalent of a Dorito and you may not realize it. So, I'm going to give you some answers about what to do and I'm going to ground them also in neuroscience. Okay, you know how there's the, uh, this is the first one. Can I just ask, how am I doing on time? Is everybody, is, any, is everybody asleep? I can't see it. <laughs> My wife. How, 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 how are we doing? Seven, Seven till. Ten till. How long have I been in the after? I've been going about 40 minutes. 40 minutes? Can you handle about 10 more minutes? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Look, I wanna, I'm going to come back to the car at the end and tell you a little bit about it, but I just want to talk about what you might do. Now that you've realized, I hope, that your phone is not merely all those things that you think it is. It is all those things. It is also something plain to you in very, very primitive ways that may actually be the real reason you're answering the phone. Not the reasons that you told yourself. So what can you do? You know all those campaigns like Take Back the Night or Take Back the White House or Take Back the Capitol? <laughs> Are you ready? I have your mantra. I guess after you see it, you'll realize I, I got no business on Madison Avenue. Are you ready? This is your first mantra. Take back the checkout aisle. Here's what I want you to do to just try to see what happens. I don't know about you, but I can hardly stand in a checkout aisle anymore without checking my phone. These are little tiny moments. Tiny, tiny moments. I'm going to give you the neuroscience in a minute, but I want you to think about the concept of taking back nickels and dimes of your attention. Why? There are a bunch of reasons for it I'll get into in the next few slides. But what happens when you are constantly interrupted, when you are constantly stimulated, is that it affects no less than your learning and memory. Every time you are stimulating yourself, you are taking up little bits, little bits of your neurological resources 
your working memory, parts of your ability of your hippocampus to process information. And I'll give you an example by way, this goes along with, uh, we talked about don't be a rat with, with uh, intermittent reinforcement, but don't be a rat refers to the checkout aisle too. I want to give you a study that they did at UCSF just down the road, one of the premier research institutes. Extraordinary researcher, I don't, I don't know how he did this, but it's truly incredible. He studies the brain waves of a rat. And what he does is he takes a rat and puts a rat on, he, he, sorry, he introduces the rat to a new experience. In this case, he has the rat stand on a table the rat has never been on before. And the researcher, I'm trying to remember his name, Lauren Frank, that's right. Dr. Frank can see that the rat is developing a burst of uh, 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 brain waves that the, that the rat has not had before, a new kind of brain pattern. Then, the rat is allowed to go and rest. And what happens is, Dr. Frank can watch this experience, these brain patterns, if you will, these brain waves, make it into the hippocampus. It's the memory center of the brain. In effect, that experience has been laid down as learning and memory. However, if he stimulates the rat to have a new experience, the original pattern, the original waves, never make it into the hippocampus. They don't become learning and memory. When you are in the checkout aisle, when you are giving away all those little moments of time, lots of research, indirect and direct, backs this up. You are forfeiting the ability of your brain to synthesize things you've learned, think about things that you might want to do, process information. There's another thing I want to mention here that's so simple, and it fits in here. Emma Sapal is a terrific researcher down at Stanford who's worked with vets coming back from Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan with PTSD. So she makes this fairly modest and also fairly startling discovery. It might be modest to us who thought about this stuff, but to the guys who had PTSD, it was remarkable. She asked them to do basic breathing exercises. We probably think of meditation, but any of the iterations you might think of as meditation. Pretty soon, the startled response of these soldiers went down sharply. In a way, they stopped being as responsive to this. When they heard a door slam, they hit the deck. When you hear your phone ring, you pick it up. Emma Sapala recommends doing a little bit of breathing now and then. Absent your phone, you may empower this. You may be able to get more decisive, more deliberate, less reactive. Okay, here's another thing to think about. Let your mind wander. I will say, per my earlier caveat about the fledgling research on dopamine, this research is a little bit conflicting at this point. But there is some reasonable research, probably the lion's share of it, that shows to the extent that you can let your mind wander absent stimulation, you are, you are benefiting from the system. These are all arguments, all arguments not to put away your phone and not use it on a regular basis. These are actually leading these suggestions to a much simpler proposition. Put down your phone in little spots where you might feel the allure of it, and you may discover that you wind up able to make better decisions about your phone in the long run. I can't possibly tell you what works for you when it works for you. I do know that if you create enough brain space, you may be able to see your patterns better. You may be able to learn and remember better. Finally, I just say pick your spots. You know, look at these stats. Computer users check email or other programs 37 times per hour. Remember the woman driving in the car and how she had to, you know, she nearly swerved or she swerved out the road and nearly didn't sign? What's happening to her is happening to you when you switch all the time. Not the part about losing focus on your intended task. Yes, that, but also, you have to switch back to the task you were doing. If you switch 37 times per hour, that's a lot of switching costs, as they say. Um, 
Anyway, similar numbers. I won't, I won't go all over them. I want to, I want to read you uh, the most basic, simple, wonderful, lovely advice that I got from uh, the, uh, the guy who heads the Harvard, uh, the Center of Media and Child Health at Harvard Medical School. He says, the headline is, bring back boredom. Downtime is to the brain what sleep is to the body. All right, that's a few cues broadly, a few suggestions broadly for how to take back your brain from this relationship, establish something more even-handed. So you use it for the, 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 the slave, really, that it is, the tool that it is, and not be enslaved yourself. I want to take you back to the car for a second. Well, just this is how I put what Michael said another way. To the focus go the spoils. I think that's where we're headed. You know, we had this notion of digital divide. It long meant those who have technology and those who don't. I think it's going to come to be defined as those who can use their technology judiciously, who can have it empower them, and those who are overtaken by it. Okay. Um, look, can we talk for, do we have five minutes to tell you why, it's, why what's happening in the car is happening? Yeah? Okay. I want to end where I began by talking about the car because there's more going on than merely this disconnect born of the intense allure of our phone. That is a part of why we are even more likely to use our phones behind the wheel than we were three, four years ago. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, tomorrow on the front page of the New York Times, I've I've got an article that is describing uh, just how concerned safety advocates have gotten about, um, about the growing problem here. And I'll, I'll tell you, Pam, maybe we can discuss the textilizer. There's a really interesting development that's come out of the state of New York that is the equivalent of the breathalyzer. I'll come to it in a minute. But let me go back to the car. What's different now from past fights that we've had on public safety issues behind the wheel? We know certain things work. We know it. We think we know it. We thought we knew it. With seatbelts and drunk driving, we had a basic, forgive me, <laughs> play on words, on intended rules for the road. Tough laws with tough enforcement, plus strong public education equals change. Well, we've had these laws passed. We've had somewhat reasonable enforcement. We've had tons of public awareness. One of the problems is some of the solutions we've come up with aren't actually working. Can you play this for me, Tiffany, please? Contact Joel Cooper. Oh, good boy. Please say your command after the beat. Call Anna Turner. Call Henry Burns. <laughs> no. To call. No. Okay. So. One of the issues is, is some of the technological solutions we imagine might be a benefit are not proving to be a benefit. In fact, um, even when these things work, they don't ameliorate the neurological cost, the, the, attention, the cost to attention that comes from interacting with your device. But as these show, um, using hands-free often, as one researcher said to me, leads to an argument between the driver and his or her car. <laughs> so, the one thing is our technological solutions have thus far worked. Another thing is that some people are promising technological solutions that are uh, potentially more of a problem than they are a solution, not just the one you've seen, but this is an example of, of a of technology that is backed by Qualcomm, I believe, in which you're going to get projected in a hologram in front of you on the road. All right, the idea is your eyes are still on the road. Are your eyes still on the road? Of course not. There's not a neuroscientist alive who studies this subject who thinks it's a good idea. A lot of what this stems from, and this is what I really want to mention to you tonight to recognize, is that as in journalism, politics, a broader mantra for investigation of any kind, we must follow the money. No one ever told you when society was trying to get people to wear seatbelts that it was a good idea not to wear your seatbelt. 
Someone might have said, I don't like a law that tells me what to do, but no one ever said, don't wear your seatbelt, that's a good idea. And I have learned, do you know the name Candace Leitner who started MAD? She fought some pretty remarkable battles after her daughter was killed. One of them was against the alcohol industry. We've talked about this a bit, but I doubt that anybody told you it was a good idea to drink and drive. Sometimes there were ads, she tells me, showing people with open containers. But no one ever told you that was a good idea. But here's the thing today. Some of our most powerful industries in this country are sending the message that it's okay to multitask behind the wheel. Today, for the most part, it's the car industry which is working very hard to get us into the showroom. And one of the ways they're doing it is by giving us gadgets behind the wheel. This is the 17-inch screen in the Tesla. Maybe an enviable car in all ways but that. Before it was the car industry, it was the phone industry. You know where they put up their first cell phone towers? On the highways. Why did they do it? It was the only place you couldn't talk on the phone. These are some of our biggest industries who have been sending us the message that it's okay to be connected behind the wheel. Now, the phone industry has backed off. If you think that they've gotten religion, and I think to a large extent they have, just also note their business models have changed. Once they got a, a big money per minute, remember when you had the brick phone and you willingly paid four bucks a minute? Well, now they sell minutes by the bucket in an unlimited fashion. They do not need you on the phone while you're in the car. In fact, they'd probably rather not have you on the phone or even texting at that time because those are prime network minutes, they'd rather have used another way. So understand what the forces are there, and finally I'd add to these forces before I sum up. There are broader societal forces that would have us connected all the time. These also are big industrial forces. In no way, in no way is this any, any kind of anti-capitalist thing. In fact, I think market forces can wind up working for safety in a lot of ways, and may well in this conversation. But Google, Yahoo, Apple, go down the list. They don't necessarily are telling you to stay connected behind the wheel, but they are essentially saying through their advertising, be on all the time. That is eyeballs, that subscription, the advertising essentially makes you look like a loser if you can't get a cell signal on Everest. Who are you to be out of touch? You are old. You are the wrong generation. It is cool to be on all the time. Okay, I'm going to tell you two last things. One study, and then I'm going to give you advice from a three-year-old, and then I will sum, and then I will finish. The study is the chocolate cake study. Maybe if you don't think about anything else I've said tonight, remember the chocolate cake study. Some of you may have heard of it. I'll simplify it a bit. A bunch of people go into a room, and they're asked to choose a bunch of study subjects. Would you like the snack? Would you like the chocolate cake for a snack? Or would you like the fruit? <laughs> Some of the people are asked to remember a short number of digits. To a significant, to a statistically significant degree, the people who are asked to remember the digits wind up much more likely to choose the cake. What gives? It's like this. When your brain is taxed, by even something so small as remembering a few digits, when your working memory is taxed, which is an area of the brain from which you draw acute inf information in an acute situation, it can compromise the thing, not just your decision making, but the very thing we think of as our free will. By analogy, this is backed up by lots of other science. It's not isolated. When you are in the car and your hands are on the wheel, you are taking up some of your brain. So when the phone rings, already your decision making is compromised. Already the thing you think about as your free will is compromised. The best time to make that decision is before you get in the car, before your working memory is taken up, before you're already compromised, before you're staring at the fire and you get the tap on the shoulder. Turn off the phone and put it in the middle of the car. You are going to see tomorrow in the New York Times that the preliminary 
estimates for road fatalities in 2015 were up 8% from 2014. It is the highest increase in 50 years. I had the privilege to talk to the head of NHTSA of the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration yesterday. We were talking about this. He said, yeah, maybe half of that. 3-4% maybe is due to an improved economy, more miles driven. The rest, that's human behavior. Make the decision ahead of time, but don't take it from a piece of chocolate cake. Take it from my son. This is not my son. Uh, it's a rough approximation of all babies. My son is now seven. His name is Milo. I will tell you a true story in, 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 as I sum up. He's about three, and we are back in um, we're back in, in Denver at my in-laws. In fact, before I finish, just a quick round of, of applause for my wife, who's come joining me tonight. Thank you. Can you imagine how tired she is of hearing me talk? <laughs> so we're back at, at her parents' house, and Milo, who's three at the time, he's walking across the floor, and his foot bumps into one of those Fisher Price, Price mobile phones. And so it rains. The, the kid causes it to ring. And he picks it up, and my son, I don't know that he knows the words he's about to say, and I certainly wouldn't have believed he says them in the following order. He picks up the phone, Milo, he puts it to his ear, I'm sitting there watching to him, I can attest to this, and he says, I'll call you from a landline. <laughs> now, the best I can infer is that he heard me with shoddy service, and he picked up one of daddy's go-to phrases. Uh, let me leave you with this. Chocolate cake, or if you prefer, you'll call back from the landline. Thank you very much. relevant speakers for us in the Davis community. 
This group is 100% volunteer and operates solely on sponsorships and donations, and they serve the children and the continued parent education for our community. And that's why we continue to support this group. So tonight, it's a hard thing for me to do, ask for money, but let's make a real commitment. Does that mean I have to get on? <laughs> commit to making sure that these are, are um, afforded to us in the future by donating. And I know sometimes when I get asked to donate, I'm kind of unsure about how much I should donate. And so for us, our recommendation is 10 bucks. How many of you think this was worth 10 bucks? Right? If you could afford more, put a little bit more in the envelope. And again, this is not an easy thing for people to stand up here and ask for more donations. I know we get tapped, you know, the well has always gone to um, the same people kind of thing, but, um, but we really do think that this is a worthwhile organization bringing some fantastic resources to our community. So the bottom line is, um, whatever you can do, uh, there's a envelope like this that you can enthusiastically and generously fill with the checks made out to um, empower YOLO with DPU in the subject line and place your check or cash in the envelope you received when you walked in and if you need one I'm sure somebody will run to you um, and the DPU volunteers are ready for donations they're along the aisles here with their baskets so as Matt said tap your neighbor on the shoulder make them respond and um, fill the basket. So with that, thank you all for what you do and what you contribute to the, the community. And I will turn this back over to Pam. Thanks everyone. Part, 
there's not an urgent reason to be doing it. I think if you explore how you use your phone during the day, it's often far less urgent than you imagine it is. Um, so, I mean, the, the first thing I hope is just understanding these mechanisms that are at play tonight. Uh, you know, with radio, you might also wonder, well, how much does that take up? It, there was an argument when radio first came into the car that that would be distracting. You know what? There's no doubt that it is to some extent distracting. 32,000 people are dying on the roads every year, with 94% of that being human behavior. We are getting distracted. All things being equal, you would love to be able to just focus on the road, but quite honestly, driving is most often so easy that it's boring. It's why you get away with texting some of the time. The radio is a reasonable alternative in this respect. It takes up less of your brain function to listen to the radio than it does to process a conversation and say something back to somebody. That takes up not only, you know, you're not only listening, you're processing and forming an answer, you're using your visual cortex to picture what's going on in the conversation. You're fairly well hijacked in that moment. What about some, I mean, some really practical tips? Say somebody does not have this iron willpower to ignore the phone ringing. I right. mean, do you, I've, I think I've heard police officers and highway patrolmen suggest putting your phone in the back seat? Or oh, yeah, sorry. Phone? Yeah, no, that's, you should give the talk. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. And you can recite the alternating letters and numbers. All right, listen. <laughs> the, the reason I don't do that is I can't even get to three. <laughs> Uh, you know what you should do? You should put your phone in the glove compartment. Too. So I, 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 I should know, but it's a, great, it's a great point. I mean, look, that was, I guess that was sort of my point about making the decision ahead of time. If you can make that decision ahead of time, then you won't be seduced by the prospect. You can put it on silent. You know, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a line by uh, a guy named Steve Largent. who used to be a, uh, a uh, Seattle Seahawks wide receiver before he went and became the head of the phone industry, um, he was the phone industry spokesman, back when we were writing the series that ultimately won the Pulitzer Prize. And he said people don't, you know, they want to be on the phone in the car. There's already technology to stop it. It's called the off button, and people don't use it. <laughs> now, there was much wrong about the case that the industry was making then, but he was right about that, and that off button is still there. You can also download for free from AT&T, Verizon, and other companies for free software that will effectively shut down your phone from ringing when it senses that it's moving at the speed of a car. And if you're the passenger, you can just disable that. Food for thought. Hmm, good to know. Um, this question asks, are there any health risks associated with smartphones or tablets or wireless earpieces near or on your body all day and or all night? Yeah, I, I've looked a little bit at this, enough to know that it's, it's the, the research is too early to say much about. There have been a couple pretty pointed articles talking about the electromagnetic frequencies. I haven't seen enough that I could get invested journalistically in it right now. Uh, I do know that to, to, to create some distance, they've moved where the, I think, where the antenna is, down to the mouth area, so it's away from the head. I mean, it kind of, this is not, this is not a New York Times reporter speaking. This is just Matt. Kind of wigs me out to put the thing by my head, but I got nothing to back that up. So, <laughs> okay. make your own call on that. Um. Well, I'm going to ask you to put your uh, New York Times hat back on. You asked me to bring up the text analyzer. Yes. I'm glad you did. So this, this story tomorrow that I uh, mentioned in the front page uh, was, is mentions to, spends a bunch of time on what is a, a, a kind of a landmark moment in this conversation. Um, after nearly a decade looking at this subject, uh, well, really six, seven years looking at this subject, I've watched various ideas come up that seem like versions of other ideas that have come up to solve the problem. In the New York State Legislature right now has been introduced an idea that seems on the order of profoundly different. It's got maybe very serious problems associated with it, but it's called the textilizer. I'll let you make your own decision, obviously, but I'll tell you some of the pros and cons. It would work like this. It would be a new roadside test akin to a breathalyzer. 
With a breathalyzer, if you get pulled over and there's reason to believe that for the officer that you may be drunk or under the influence, you must take a breathalyzer or risk suspension of your license. In this case, at any crash site, if this law were passed, an officer would be allowed to ask for your phone, would plug it into a machine that would mention what activity has happened, not what the communications were, but whether there has been any activity, emailing, texting, other apps that are prohibited by the hands-free law, and when it happened. The text -alizer. The ACLU, among others, is gravely concerned about the privacy implications here. There are other issues you might be able to imagine as problems. For instance, what if you did voice to text? Right, this and is it's really thorny. thorny. Yeah. It's very thorny. Here, there are two things about it that are make it noteworthy. Well, just to address the legal issue, the way this, the, the, the gentleman who's introduced this, a Democrat named Felix Ortiz passed the nation's first hands-free law in New York in 2001. He's got some gravitas on this. And he, it is, is co-sponsored in a bipartisan manner with a powerful member of the Republican-controlled Senate. So it has bipartisan backing. The argument they make on the legal, may I go on just a bit more about this? Sure. Yeah. The legal front is. Okay, you have several minutes. Okay, okay. all right. Okay. The, the argument they make on the legal front is having a, a driver's license is a privilege, not a right. And just as we use that argument to allow a breathalyzer, so we would allow it in this case. The other case they make is we have got to do something. We need a greater kind of deterrence. I'll ask you the question. When I first heard about this, actually, I was, I was speaking in San Anselmo. And I asked this question the very day I heard about this. I want to ask you guys, if you knew that an officer could pull, could test your phone the minute a crash happened, would it deter you from using your phone behind the wheel? Just raise your hand if that's the case. Yeah. So, I mean, that, there, there's a, I, I won't call it desperation, but there's real concern right now about what's happening behind the wheel, and this is an effort to find an answer. As there should be as well. Let's talk about this whole switching gears thing. Yep. Digits, numbers, uh, letters. Because um, I see people, as I mentioned in my introduction of you, that I see a lot of people at stoplights yep. taking a quick glance. And it, it would seem, I would think, to the user to be harmless. That yes. I'm just taking a quick glance and, oh, the light just turned green, I'm going to put it down, and I'm completely focused back on driving. Is that so? It's a great question, Pam, and the answer is, Yes, most of the time it is harmless. This is why we are terrible scientists in our own lives. It goes like this. A hundred times you text and drive, and a hundred times you get away with it, and you therefore you tell yourself, you use the big old ergo, a hundred percent of the time, I don't get in a wreck, therefore I won't. Here's the problem. You mentioned the switching costs. Take it from a guy who's been looking at horrible, deadly accidents for six or seven years. There comes a time when you have almost no margin for error. You don't know what it is. There is no crystal ball. I'll tell you a story about a guy who was, just to this point, who was driving across the Golden Gate Bridge north. He was in his lane. He was on a hands-free phone. He was talking to his wife about what to order from an Indian food restaurant. A car coming the other direction on one of those windy days on the bridge swerved just a touch across the yellow divider. He was looking ahead. By the time he had the opportunity to react away from his call, he had killed the driver of the other car. That was not his fault. Maybe you would say, well, that was her problem. I doubt most of us would say that. It's the kind of example I'm sure you've had this happen, where you look up from any number of things, the radio, your phone, glancing at a stop sign, your kid in the back, and you realize, I missed my exit. Oh, I should have gotten off there. I should have turned right. The switching costs in that circumstance can be done. Are there any states remaining that don't have hands-free laws? Well, only 14 states have hands-free laws, so okay. it's the, it's so it's the, the majority. majority. Okay, the, the majority, majority of not have hands-free. 46 plus uh, Guam, uh, District of Columbia, Virgin Islands. For some reason, I feel like it's all the places who voted for Rubio. <laughs> have, te <laughs> have texting, uh, have texting bans. What's the holdup in in the 46 states? Is, is it is it a is it a powerful you know, like mobile phone lobby or? Less so the mobile phone lobby. Uh, when we have more time, I'll, I'll tell you some of the remarkable things they said when they won the fight in the past. But there are a lot of legislators who will tell you, as they have told me, I rely on this phone behind the 
wheel. I need to be able to use this. It's when I get business done. It's when my constituents get business done. I can't do that or in a kind of, if you, if you take the, these are broad generalizations, gross generalizations, but some of the more conservative states, they will say, look, no one can tell me what to do when I'm in the car. Similar arguments were made about seatbelts. Uh, they were made about drunk driving to some extent. They're being made now. Did you, in your research for your articles and your book, look at technology's effect on the growing brain? My five-year-old, for instance, loves the phone. It's like yes. candy to him. Yeah. This is a great question. The study, I think, is going to come out in the next few days summarizing the impact on young people's brains. I, I want to tell you that um, try as I try as try. Okay, I got to do the whole thing over. <laughs> um, as, as, as much as I've looked into it, the research is very early, and there's not a ton I can tell you. Let me tell you what I can what I can say for certain. Well, I'll say two things. My kids are the same age, roughly as yours. I don't know anybody. How many have young kids? Or you know, I, I think you probably would agree with me. Um, I certainly feel this way with my kids at this age. It's probably the hardest battle we face, face as parents right now, mm -hmm. is what to do about the media time. So let me tell you the one thing we can be sure of that the research bears out, and then I'll tell you some stuff that's less direct that we're learning. In addition to all the stuff I told you already about learning and memory, which is applicable to older and younger, there is, at the very least, a really serious opportunity cost when your kids spend a lot of time on media. This is what the scientists will tell you. Being outside, moving, social interaction, which develops empathy, that is no small thing. So there is at the least an opportunity cost for other stuff that is proven to be beneficial. There's also some early research that begins to suggest that learning may be affected. There's some research out of the University of Washington that shows when you manipulate blocks as a little, as a toddler, you get some the secretion of certain learning chemicals that you don't get when you watch a show. There's certain um, research that shows when kids watch like SpongeBob, they become much more hyperactive, which might have a, uh, might have an, uh, might attend or uh, have something to do with attention. This research is very early. It is something researchers are very compelled by right now. I'll tell you finally what the American Pediatric Association says. They say now, two hours a day for a kid of screen time? Do you know that it used to be, for kids under two, it used to be two hours a week? If you ask the people who really know why the American Pediatric Association changed that view, it's not because they think kids should watch two hours a day, it's because they felt that they would be seen as irrelevant if they didn't change their view. So the, the, the people who know about this are concerned, the research is very early. Very interesting. So how best then to convince teens not to selfie and drive or Snapchat and drive? You showed us those really alarming statistics. Yeah. And you showed us that purple brain that showed that executive function isn't fully developed yeah. until someone is say in their in their, you know, like early twenties or so. So I mean what's a what's a frightened parent to do and tell their child? I've heard, I've heard two things, to, I've heard lately from talking to safety advocates for this story I'm doing tomorrow, who are trying to up the ante for all of us, that they're, they, they look at safety in two ways, and I'm going I'm to tie this back to our kids in a second. One is a long-term horizon, which is about education, and one is a short-term horizon, which says, basically, I don't care what you think, I'm going to make you stop. And that's what we wound up doing with drunk driving, we created a so sharp, harsh. I hate to be so blunt about this, but I think if I were to interpret their language in, the, in a family setting, it would be educate your kids as much as you can. But this is a non-negotiable. So this is like, hey, I'm going to get the thing from the insurance company that tells me if you were on the phone, and I'm going to take it away if you do this. Uh, I'm going to go look at what I'm going to. I'm going to look at your phone behavior. I'm going to monitor it with my phone to make sure. I mean, in this case, when behind the wheel of a deadly weapon, and, and, and teen drivers are notoriously the worst. I don't think it's about convincing anybody. I think we have to move. We have to move beyond that. And, and some states now are getting to that point where, in New York, for example, if you're under 21 and get caught twice texting while driving, you lose your license for a year. 
So society is beginning to take those steps. I don't think parents should be any far behind, should not be behind that if they want to be certain their teens are compliant. Sorry, teens. <laughs> <laughs> it's for your own good. Um, thank you very much. We want to thank Matt Rickdahl, um, author of A Deadly Wandering, for being with us. Well, and be safe and have a great time.